I will say as somebody who's watching this from afar, I've, I've learned a lot about the politics of, of Atlanta and, and Fulton County, but then also some weird history of the Atlanta Police Department and just some red flags as somebody who covered the Spokane Police Department that had tons of problems and was, you know, who even knows what they were doing up there all the time. But the fact that the all the detectives were moonlighting uh, had, had had extra jobs. And I mean, Detective Dennis even testified it was because his salary was so piss poor. I mean, is there something to be said about what was going on in the Atlanta Police Department with all this stuff? And the fact that these guys say that they're retired, but really it looks like they just took jobs in other jurisdictions. And then a lot of this stuff, when you're hearing about this, it's like, okay, if this was such a big deal, why wasn't this charged back in 2015? And it's like, well, the detectives who were inv investigating this back in 2015 seem to have a lot of baggage. What, what, what am I getting into here? Is this just an outsider kind of observing with a real facial observance of, of Fulton County or? Well, there's a, there's a long history with the Atlanta Police Department. There's a, there's a lady named Katherine Johnston who lived on Neal Street on the west side of Atlanta, whose, um, whose house was burglarized by police serving a faulty warrant one day and she allegedly shot at who she thought were intruders and she was shot dead. She was something like 92 years old. Okay. That was red dogs running every drug dealer out of Georgia, I think is what it stands for or something like that. Okay. That's, that's the historical context of all this. So when you hear officers not want to say they were red dog, because people in Atlanta, presumably people on the jury, know what that means. And yeah. so then they relabeled it Apex. I think they call it Apex now. I'm not certain about that, but I think that's that's what became Apex. And so, so there is a history. There is a history with the community. Uh, there's a history of distrust. And I'm not saying all police officers, that's not me. Um, but I am saying that there were events that happened. And there's... A history to all of this. And so you have that, and then you also have retention problems with APD. And um, I don't, you know, it seems normal to me, but maybe it's abnormal. You know, this is all I know. But yes, when you go to the store, when you go to Target in Atlanta, when you go to the liquor store in Atlanta, when you go to the Braves game, you're going to see off-duty police officers making extra money on the side in uniform. That's just kind of normalized to me. I don't yeah. know how it is in other jurisdictions. So that doesn't surprise me so much. Um, and, and yeah, it, it is also true that apparently there were homicide investigators that retired and then were rehired on some sort of contract basis. I don't know, to help younger investigators or whatever. I think that that was the deal with um, with uh, Quinn and Velasquez. Um, so there's a lot going on here. But, the the you know, as, as a member of the press, the Red Dog story is a, a real story in Atlanta history. And, and it was, um, sounded like a roving civil rights violation when I heard just a brief description of it. I think it was Detective Quinn that or right. somebody talked about it. I was like, that sounds extremely right. problematic. Right. And and it was, everyone was proud to be red dog, red dog, red dog. We're running drug dealers out. And then all of a sudden no one wanted to be red dog. And then we're rebranding it as something else. Um, but that's just kind of how it went. Hopefully, you know, and I'm not, I don't have inside knowledge on this, so I'm not going to, you know, say too much about it. Hopefully some of the procedures and everything else changed be, besides the name. But yeah, if you go to Neal Street in in Atlanta, it's probably eight minutes from the courthouse. It's in a it's in a neighborhood that's a little bit run down, but you still see a, a mural of Miss Johnston on that on that house. Wow. Uh, another thing that surprised me was when uh, they brought the uh, recusal motion for Judge Krause to try to get a recuse from the recusal motions over the the two thousand dollar 
campaign donation. I was just surprised that we that incumbent judges in Fulton County feel the need to fundraise at all, let alone like 167,000 that she'd raised for re-election when the thinking is, at least in Orange County Superior Court, Los Angeles County Superior Court, the incumbent judges are pretty much given to get reelected. So there isn't really any campaigning going on, but obviously that's different in Fulton County. Has it been like that for a while? Um, there's generally, in my experience, not too many incumbent judges that are challenged. Um, for instance, and I'm just using this as an example, Judge Glanville, I believe that he was up on the ballot this year um, and no one challenged him. Um, yeah. That's pretty standard and normal. I know that Judge Krause uh, had a challenger and she won re-election. Um, but I, again, I'm not, this is not my expertise, but my understanding of the process is the goal is to uh, raise money so people don't challenge you. Yeah. Um, so you're you're not quote unquote the weakest link, and and people that want to challenge someone will go on to the next person. So yeah. that that's my understanding of it, but I don't know too much about it. Yeah. 